Hello world and welcome to this edition of Tech on Fire with Blaze. I'm Blaze Stewart, architect at Winelect, and today we're going to be doing an intro into Azure Landing Zones, but this will be the first in a couple of videos that we're going to be talking about Azure Landing Zones and building one of those out. Hi guys, today we're going to be talking about an Azure landing zone and we're going to be talking through the complexities of what this really entails. Now Azure landing zones broadly defined are the first things that you do whenever you start deploying things into Azure. Really you do this before you get your first applications even into Azure. And we're going to be looking at the various things that go into defining an Azure landing zone today. So we're going to be talking about this more through the lens of theory. And I want to talk about the various aspects of it and then orient you towards some documentation and resources that you can use to help you better understand it. But over the next few weeks, we're going to be doing a series of videos where we try to make this more practical, where we build out an Azure landing zone in more of a lab type context so you can get familiar with how some of these concepts apply to the various resources that we're going to be talking about on Azure. So it's going to be using a lot of the things that I've discussed on this channel already from identity and access management from resource management, uh, networking concepts, and a lot of other types of things that we can put into an Azure landing zone to actually build one out. And you'll see how that actually looks once we're done with this series. But today it's focused on theory. So uh, we're gonna be looking at just mostly slides and resources from that angle. An Azure landing zone is basically your first steps into Azure. So you have a lot of things you have to consider before you even get your first workloads in Azure. And one of the most fundamental concepts is identity and access management. Now identity and access management on Azure is managed through Azure AD and Azure AD is the identity store. So if you have other identity stores, you can integrate those with Azure AD to get those IDs into Azure. I, Azure AD doesn't have to be used for authentication. You can use uh, federation if you want to do some kind of federated model for authentication. But ultimately, you need to get those IDs into Azure so that you can set up RBAC, which is the roles that you have defined on Azure. And with RBAC, that's basically permissions that are assigned to a given role. Then you assign users into those roles so that they can execute whatever that role is prescribed to do within an Azure context. The next thing that we look at is subscription management. This is pretty straightforward. This is basically getting your subscription set up and then managing those and management groups would be how you do that. Now, subscription uh, management depends on the kind of subscriptions that you're using. You might have EA subscriptions or maybe you have pay as you go or sponsored subscriptions or, or trial subscriptions, whatever you have, you can manage all that with management groups. And management groups basically gives you the ability to set up hierarchies that either reflect your organizational structure, your functional structure, so that, that you can uh, create the groups of subscriptions and then assign our are back to those subscriptions at a high level rather than having to go into every single subscription and manage it that way. So even if you have a few subscriptions, it's probably not a bad idea to set up management groups just to manage them uh, more at a high level rather than trying to manage each one of those individually. Now, the next topic is governance and security, which covers a whole wide range of things that you have to consider on Azure. Identity and access management would could be considered uh, as part of security, but generally it's best to think of that as something separate because it is a uh, thing that you have to kind of configure out of the gate get, to get your tenant set up on Azure. But once you have that set up, governance and security kind of takes on a whole life of its own beyond identity and access management because you have to consider things like Azure policy, security concepts, and cost management and monitoring. Azure policy, of course, is how you manage Azure uh, from a policy perspective. So this is looking at things like compliance. It's looking at restrictions uh, based on organizational constraints, such as I can only operate in these given regions because I'm under you know compliance constraints or uh, resource constraints in that you don't want to allow users to create uh, virtual machines of a specific kinds for billing reasons. But Azure policy is, is a set of tools to enforce those kinds of rules and to also audit those kinds of rules rules for security purposes and compliance purposes. And of course, there's security concepts on Azure. This, this includes things like firewalling, uh, this uh, security um, tools like Azure Security Center and Azure Sentinel 
and then also getting into the weeds with things like network security groups and data encryption. And there's a lot of you know, technical details that go into some of those security concepts, depending on the kind of workload you're going to be putting into uh, Azure. And then cost management is obviously one of those things that folks have uh, concerns with when they go to Azure is like, how much is it going to cost me to operate my workloads on Azure? Because it is a consumption based model and cost management tools include setting up things like cost centers so they can get a view into your Azure spend, but also getting your, your tagging stories in line and also making sure your resources are appropriately allocated into the right kinds of subscriptions so that you can uh, maximize your Azure usage without having to spend unnecessary uh, dollars on those resources. And of course, there is monitoring and monitoring is a big deal on Azure. So you have the one per the kind of Swiss Army knife tool for that, which is Azure Monitor, which has a whole suite of tools inside of that for uh, collecting metrics and logs on resources so that you can get an idea of what's going on in Azure. And then you can build dashboards and alerts and a lot of other kinds of things within that context as well. Now, beyond governance security, we have networking shared resources and we look at Azure networking concepts here. Now, this, of course, relates to network security, but it also is the kind of shared resources that we would have in an Azure environment, such as on premise connectivity. If you're going to be maintaining a hybrid type scenario where you maintain an on premise data center and an Azure cloud, you have to set up uh, things like a VPN or an express route. And you would also need some shared resources across that VPN or that express route, such as domain controllers or DNS servers or uh, network virtual appliances and things like that. And you might also have some kind of data sharing that you need to set up, such as file syncs between data uh, file shares on Azure and on-premise file shares and get all of those kinds of shared resources uh, set up across uh, the, the environments that you're going to be using. So those are some of the kind of concepts that we think about when we talk about shared resources and networking in our Azure landing zone. So once you kind of have that all figured out, there's the, the last piece, which is kind of infrastructure as code. And the way we, that we'd manage that on, on Azure is typically with ARM templates. Of course, you can use something like Terraform or other types of, of resource management that uses the that uses infrastructure as code to do that. But ARM templates are the native way to do that. And with ARM templates, basically you're setting up uh, this prescriptive scripts, if you will, or configuration files that you can then pass into an engine and create resources on Azure. And the reason that we do this is to provide automation so that we can uh, replicate our environments for dev test purposes, or we can use them for disaster recovery scenarios where we need to spin up new environments rather quickly. And rather than create all those manually, we can create a deployment using our ARM templates and quickly have resources spun up in a correct configuration and then get those uh, resources going to work for us to run our, our workloads in the event that we have a failure. When starting an Azure journey, there's two approaches that are commonly used for adopting Azure. The first one is the start small approach. And this one basically starts with deploying a basic application to Azure. And this is probably the most common way that folks approach Azure. What they'll do is they'll get their initial configurations figured out. They'll get some basic RBAC in play. They'll get their identity set up. They'll have some basic networking and they'll have some of that basic landing zone stuff configured out and they will have a small workload that they intend to move in as kind of a, the pilot workload for Azure. It's usually low risk and it's usually not something that is going to take a lot of effort to move it into Azure. And the reason folks do this is so that they can get some of that experience they need for managing Azure and learn some of the idiosyncrasies of Azure and just get a comfortable working in the environment. And once that initial workload is done, the risk factors are known. A lot of the things that were kind of hidden or brought into the light because of those original workloads moving into Azure kind of expose a lot of those things that people didn't think about when going into Azure. Now, we try to educate folks the best we can. However, it's not always possible to get everything considered whenever you're trying to do a video like this or you're reading the docs. There's always going to be something that might not have been thought of, and you have to kind of bring that into the light and consider it. And that's what those initial workloads do. The next thing that you do then is you kind of say, okay, we're going to take it up a notch and we're going to do a more 
a critical workload. This might be a larger workload or a higher risk workload. And this is where you might uh, expand on some of those original things that you try to do in your um, Azure landing zone. Maybe you uh, go from like a VPN to an express route or you define more roles that you might need to run these new workloads or you uh, fine tune some of the rules that you might already have or you expand the network that you originally created. You start to build out that environment, but you try to do it in a modular way so that you can continually grow as your workloads on Azure mature. And then finally, when you kind of get uh, those uh, middle tier workloads done, then you can go into some of those high risk workloads right here where you're talking about moving some of your mission critical applications into an Azure context. And these are the ones that require that the environment be very secure. You've kind of considered everything that you need to know to make that work well in Azure. So it'll be secure, it'll be uh, available, it will be uh, scalable among many other things that you have to kind of take into consideration. And this is approach, uh, this approach is often used by small organizations or even enterprises that aren't really uh, sure about Azure. And it's probably the most common approach that folks you take when moving into Azure. The next approach is generally a taken by large organizations, typically organizations that sign an enterprise agreement with Microsoft or something like that, where they don't have the luxury of, of moving into Azure in a more uh, small steps approach. They have to kind of take everything in consideration and try to plan for it up front before ever getting into Azure and moving their entire enterprise in that direction. So this one typically works like this, where you kind of have this architecture where you're trying to uh, frame everything according to all the considerations that you have to look at. Now, this is a reference architecture that I got off the uh, Azure Docs that just kind of gives you an idea of the, the scope and scale of all the various things that you kind of have to look at. And I mentioned a lot of these already, such as shared services, networking, management, and uh, policy. And there's a lot of other resources that we could go into great depth, even in looking at this particular uh, reference architecture. But this idea right here is, is trying to pull everything apart and look at each individual part prior to going to Azure for an organization so that they can get their applications into Azure. Now, there are other reference architectures available for different types of scenarios, but this is kind of looking at it from a uh, single subscription, uh, perhaps. Now, you could, of course, expand this to uh, multiple subscriptions uh, and grow as needed. But this is the idea of what you're trying to do is, is like map this all out consider everything that you need to consider. And then once you kind of have that kind of figured out, then you kind of take this, apply it, and then start moving all your workloads into Azure without taking those more you know, baby steps and, and growing into Azure. This is more about just taking it, adopting it wholesale, and then moving into it that way. So if you're interested in getting more into the weeds on this, the, the place to go would be the Cloud Adoption Framework. And the Cloud Adoption Framework is a set of documents that provides a guide and a framework and a set of best practices for moving workloads into Azure. So this is very comprehensive and there's uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of articles inside of the Cloud Adoption Framework that will try to orient you towards adopting Azure and the Azure Cloud. Now, the one thing that we've been looking at over the last several weeks is kind of doing assessments and a lot of that kind of stuff and that's a part of doing uh, cloud adoption and a part of the cloud adoption framework is dedicated to that kind of content as well so if you want to look at that i would encourage you to read it but the the piece that uh it kind of drives to a lot of that assessment work and a lot of that uh, planning is in azure landing zone which is right here and it takes up a lot of the uh, docs that you're going to be reading about if you so choose to do that so you can come into an Azure, this doc here and uh, you can peruse it and it'll give you some uh, uh, the next button that you can click through to, to look at the various design areas that we you mentioned and uh, the considerations and the kinds of things that you want to look at. And here's the uh, two scales that you can look at that we just uh, I mentioned, enterprise scale, and then you can do the, the start small scale and expand and then look at that those two different paths for moving into Azure. So the Azure landing zone that I'm going to be creating over the next uh, few weeks is basically going to be a start small type approach where you can uh, create a bunch of resources that are more fundamental, maybe not as fine tuned as I'd like, but this is going to give me some 
uh, resources that I can use, then I'm going to start moving workloads into Azure to kind of show you what that process looks like based on uh, the kind of workloads that I intend to move up into my Azure environment. So we'll be looking at this from a more uh, theoretical lab type uh, approach, but it's going to be following a lot of the cloud adoption framework principles and doing the kind of assessments that we've been working through just so you can kind of get an idea of what this looks like in a more practical sense than what we've been talking about in the theory on this video and others like it. If you like this content, please consider visiting us online at www.wintelect.com and there you can find about services that Wintelect offers including training and consulting services. Also, please consider subscribing to this channel by clicking on the subscribe button and clicking the bell icon to get notifications when new content becomes available and also comment down below. You can also follow me on Twitter at the one mule and also follow Wintelect on Twitter at Wintelect now or at Wintelect. We are constantly posting things about Azure related technologies and things related to software development. You can also reach us by email at consulting at Until next time, thank you. Thank you.